half an hour or so I'm going to take you through um, some of the major challenges in psychiatry. Professor Mai has already talked about some of the risk factors and he mentioned specifically uh, war, displacement and also uh, exposure to violence. So what I'm going to do is highlight some of the issues and particularly in the context of uh, the experience of United Kingdom, you in Italy have a major problem with all the migration that is happening. And I think it also not only offers a kind of social understanding of what's going on, but is also a good opportunity for uh, further research. We know uh, what a migrant is, somebody who changes their place of residence for any purpose, for any period of time. There are legal classifications particularly related to being a refugee and an asylum seeker. I'm going to talk a bit of characteristics of uh, migration and obviously motivation for migration uh, can be a major uh, stressor or a protective factor. And we know that there are any number of occupations uh, which uh, migrate regularly, anthropologists, diplomats, people who go for uh, higher education, journalists, those who are in military service, missionaries, etc. And you can imagine that their experiences of migration are going to be very, very different from those of uh, Syrian refugees who, or Libyan refugees who are migrating uh, to Europe. But it's also worth bearing in mind, and again Professor Mai talked about organization, and that internal migration um, can create problems particularly from rural to urban areas, but equally from urban to rural areas. And obviously uh, there are many reasons for migration. People are exiled for political reasons. They may decide to migrate for economic reasons, either for business on a transient basis or on a permanent basis. And then uh, there would be students who migrate for uh, a short while or long term. And then um, film stars and pop stars who migrate regularly. So if you are uh, Madonna or George Clooney and you have a villa in Italy and a chateau in Switzerland, a chateau in France and beach house in Malibu, uh, the stress related to migration is going to be very, very different. <laughs> um, and obviously, demographics of migrants are very important in terms of adjustment, and particularly if you're a primary migrant or a secondary migrant. If you're a primary migrant, then the stress would be much more and very different. And obviously, whether it is voluntary or forced, so there have been arguments um, for a long time and what is it that predisposes people to migrate? Migration has been going on for thousands of years. It's nothing new, but the patterns change. And I'll come back to that because it's particularly in the UK context is critical to look at uh, Asian experiences versus African uh, Caribbean experiences. And you also know people react to migration in very different ways. Some people become very enthusiastic about migration, become very over-accepting, deny any difficulties, and are actively critical of the culture they have left behind or the culture they move to. Um, 
John Barry has written extensively about acculturation and adjustment and reaction and withdrawal. And I want us to remember that there are three kinds of experiences. Uh, there is the acculturation, and which may lead to culture conflict, uh, either within the same culture or with the larger culture. There may be cultural bereavement, which is that you've left your culture behind and you're trying to adjust to the new culture and what that means. And lastly, it's about culture shock that you move from one culture to another and you don't know what has, uh, what you're faced with and what experiences you may have. So you may actually withdraw uh, rather than being part of the larger society. And there are very clear uh, stages, pre-migration, migration and post-migration. And it's not always easy to make clear distinctions because Migration, post-migration can be fairly similar and people can prepare for it as a life event and then subsequent uh, adjustment and then generational migration may not see that as a life event. Some of the changes associated with migration are about communication because you have to learn a very different language. And I have been in the UK now for 30 for 35 years. But about seven or eight years ago, um, somebody in the Royal College of Psychiatrists actually told me that I could not speak English. And, you know, what was I going to do about it? Now, 27 years after migration, if somebody is telling me that I don't know the language, it's, is it my problem or is it their problem? I think that's part of the challenge in terms of adjustment and acculturation that we need to think about. And obviously social support changes, vocational changes um, occur and social roles and there are legal implications. We know the factors responsible for distress and I'll come back to those, but there's also a, a kind of, anthropologically there is a general typology which looks at policy, whether you're forced, whether you free migration, what does that do to your aspirations and social momentum, whether you migrate by yourself or with others. And we all know um, Odegaard's study in 1932 where he looked at uh, schizophrenia in Norwegians in the United States with 1,067 individuals and 19 195 individuals in Norway um, and showed that Norwegians in the United States showed 30 to 50 percent higher incidence of psychiatric morbidity and that was 90 plus years ago. And what gets forgotten is these two findings that only 11 percent presented within two years of migration and nearly half presented after they had been in the country for 10 years or more. And I think that's quite a significant observation and we need to bear that in mind. I don't want you to go through the table, but this is a comparison of UK, African, Caribbean immigrants and uh, white natives. And I just want you to focus on this, uh, the ratio of uh, schizophrenia in UK, African, Caribbean varies from about 2.8 in women in all over England and Wales to 4.9. And then it sort of goes completely uh, unbelievable seven times higher in uh, Nottingham in 1988. Uh, we found fairly low rates at that time. But it also consistently the ratio has been fairly high, no matter whether you use case notes, hospital admissions, or own clinical diagnosis. So what that has meant is that are we looking at, when we talk about rates in migration, are we talking, looking at first generation migrants or second generation migrants? And again, that's a difference that we need to be aware of. Um, <coughs> It's quite clear that uh, 
among immigrants rates are high. Um, from 1960s onwards, um, and I'll come back to these, but even when you refine the rates, um, 1991, 94, 93, 96, 2001, and beyond, uh, these have been two studies, etiology of uh, social factors in uh, psychosis, East London first episode studies, where they made consensus diagnosis with prospective case findings, well-defined geographical areas, and uh, separated white British from non-British whites. And, and again, I, mean, I think one of the issues in when we're looking at the rates, uh, we need to bear in mind is the de question of definitions. Who is a migrant? People are born in a country and they're called second generation migrants or third gen generation migrants. Is that a fair term? Also, uh, when you compare white, uh, which is a skin color, with ethnicity, which is African Caribbean, which derives from nationality, comparisons become a problem. And again, from a research perspective, we need to be very careful about that. It's consistently, I mean, these are the uh, rates and black African um, higher, black Caribbean even higher, Asians are marginally higher, um, and similar findings emerge, the particularly mixed ethnicity starts to go up. Now, that again raises questions, is it genetic, is it social, is it biological, what's going on? And same in the first episode study uh, about seven years ago, uh, mixed white and black Caribbean rates are nearly two times those of Indians and mixed other uh, about five times. <clears throat> and age, sex, and social economic status again uh, shows there are very clear differences. Mixed white and black Caribbean um, show higher rates. Now, what is it that if you, know, you are in a mixed uh, race relationship, does that really mean that your children are going to have a higher likelihood of developing schizophrenia? And we need to sort of think about that. And again, um, in the same study, um, it was shown that the raise, raise rates of schizophrenia for Asian women, and particularly among Pakistani women. Now, what does that mean? Again, um, it's a sort of an intriguing finding. And consistently, it's confirmed uh, these findings. Um, same findings emerge in Netherlands, in Denmark, and in the United States. In Netherlands, there have been several studies, thoroughly good methodologically, looking at Surinamese, first generation, second generation, three times, Moroccan, first generation, five times, second generation, seven times, Turkish, second generation, twice, Dutch, Antilles, again, uh, relative risk, uh, twice compared. And similarly, in Denmark, and United States African Americans have shown uh, rates 3.27 times higher. Sweden, um, similarly, uh, high rates. Migrants from Europe within Sweden, as well as Asia and Africa, show higher rates. Um, interestingly, in Israel, one study showed elevated rates in first and second generation groups marginally um, but among Ethiopians, the rates go even higher up. So what is it that's going on? And since the 1980s, we've been talking about the potential reasons. And these reasons indicate um, that is it when my people migrate that we as clinicians do not understand their culture and therefore we tend to misdiagnose? Uh, is there some kind of ethnic liability of di uh, diagnosis? And 
of uh, psychosis as well as schizophrenia, is it possible, as I showed you earlier, that people who are vulnerable to schizophrenia are more likely to migrate because they're feeling restless and therefore more likely to move? And is it about some kind of obstetric complications? Is it the stress of uh, migration? Or is it cannabis use and socioeconomic disadvantages? I don't think it is a misdiagnosis. Uh, it's fairly clear. Um, I've been involved in three studies um, in London, in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, and in um, Barbados and Trinidad, which showed us very clearly that the rates using the same instrument, using the same clinicians, rates of schizophrenia in the Caribbean are lower than those seen in African Caribbeans in the UK. Now that indicates that there's something um, else that's going on. Um, we know that schizophrenia is a difficult diagnosis. There are diagnostic changes. It can be precipitated by crisis. Hallucinations and delusions are quite common, and delusions of persecu persecution can be quite common. But what does it mean in terms of um, comparisons? And I, I think I'm going to come back to that. But this is a very interesting observation which shows that social factors, particularly um, <coughs> socioeconomic disadvantage and stress of migration, are more likely to create uh, schizophrenia. Cross-sectional survey perceived discrimination, and I think it is quite interesting that um, Moroccans showed high levels of discrimination, not real discrimination, perception. How do people see me? And I think one of the major challenges in psychiatry is that in terms of identity and in terms of settling down, it's really important how you see me seeing you. So how the clinician or the employer or the large society sees an individual becomes a major uh, factor and it is, uh, again, perceived discrimination shows high rates of uh, deprivation, discrimination, and high rates of schizophrenia. So we looked at four possible additional hypotheses indicating um, ethnic variation. First one is ethnic density. The second one is about concepts of self. Who am I? What's my identity? Thirdly, it's about achievement and aspiration. What is it that I set out to achieve and how, how much I achieved and what the discrepancy between the two is? And lastly, it's about cultural congruity and I'll come back to that. Ethnic density has been looked at and there have been lots of studies and it's been a fairly mixed data. Some people have argued that ethnic density plays a role in high rates of schizophrenia. Others have argued that it does not. It is um, that risk is elevated if there are other individuals uh, less from your ethnic minority less likely to be around you. So if you're living by yourself and there are not many people around you, you're more likely to develop schizophrenia. Um, again, it's sort of uh, worth looking at. Uh, this is an interesting study about 14 years old. Uh, Jane Boydell and uh, colleagues looked at incidents uh, of schizophrenia and mapped out onto various uh, neighborhoods. But one of the things that they ignored, and I do believe that we need to look at very carefully, is that cultures have different ways of characterizing individuals. There are social centric cultures, which are people are uh, integrated into strong, cohesive in-groups, which throughout their lifetime continue to protect them in exchange for unquestioning loyalty. And then there are individualistic or egocentric cultures where uh, ties between individuals are very loose and everyone is expected to look after himself or herself and um, their immediate family. So egocentric cultures are about I, uh, it's about autonomy, it's about emotional independence. Collectivist or social-centric cultures are about emotional interdependence. 
sharing duties and obligations and need for stable and predetermined friendships and making group decisions. And Gate Hofstede has written quite a lot about cultures having different dimensions. Um, egocentricity, sociocentricity is one, but they, he also divides cultures into masculine and feminine. Uh, cultures about uh, orientation, long-term orientation as to how you see your role in life, but also he sees uh, how close you feel to the center of power. So what that means in terms of individuals and particularly in cultural congruity is that uh, you look at uh, specifically if you are a sociocentric individual from a sociocentric society migrating into an egocentric society yeah still with me if you don't have sociocentric individuals around you in egocentric society you are more likely to feel alienated you are more likely to feel um, withdrawn you are more likely to feel unsupported and therefore you are quite likely to become um, isolated, perhaps psychotic and certainly the evidence we showed in London was that African Caribbeans who live in places where they are living by themselves are more likely to be unemployed, more likely to be using cannabis. So it becomes a model where vulnerability to psychosis then gets influenced by cannabis and um, unemployment and other social factors. In the same study we looked at achievement and aspiration which showed that uh, we measured aspiration in five areas, uh, financial, educational, social, housing, employment, suggesting that if you leave your country or you pushed out of your country into another culture or another country and you find that you, know, you wanted to work as a psychiatrist and you could not get a job and you're working um, as a waiter, there's a major discrepancy in your achievement in that. and what does it do to your self-image? What does it do to your self-esteem? And we found that particularly people who were well educated, their discrepancy in achievement and aspiration was much greater. People can live in poor housing, people can cope with poor employment, but if you feel that you've got high educational levels but you can't uh, meet the standards that you'd set up, and again, two examples spring to mind. One is that um, in many countries, uh, you know, migrants who may be lawyers or uh, professionals in their own country end up driving taxis because that's the easiest job. So what does it do to your ego? What does it do to your self-esteem? So leading on from that, and again, I'm grateful to Professor Mai for giving us the opportunity for the WPA to develop guidance on managing mental health and mental health care for uh, migrants and uh, refugees. And particularly, we were looking at uh, five specific special groups. And again, Professor Mai earlier in his talk talked about uh, mental health of children and adolescents and I think it is absolutely critical in terms of public health intervention one thing that we must do is about parenting skills it is about how parents bring children up what they do in the antenatal and immediate postnatal period um, that's where the public health interventions uh, need to be. And we know, particularly for women, if they're primary migrant, there are specific issues. If they're secondary migrant, there are other issues. And there are problems, particularly in many cultures, uh, about gender roles and gender role expectations. Uh, women are expected to find jobs, bring money, and yet when they come home, they're expected to do the cooking and the cleaning and the washing and look after their uh, 
um, husbands and partners and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, for children, again, uh, one of the major challenges is um, physical abuse and sexual abuse, and again, Professor Mai talked about it earlier. Among migrants, the, certainly age dispute becomes a major issue in terms of adjustment, and that will affect the child's identity, which will affect um, particularly their awareness of who they are and their growth. And obviously, being separated from parents or uh, seasonal parental migration will cause problems. Again, um, for the elderly, there are specific issues post-migration, whether they are primary migrants or secondary migrants, or whether they come by themselves or as part of the family. And isolation, particularly, has been shown increasingly that there's multiple jeopardy in ethnicity, age, and gender. Uh, we know about refugees, somebody who is being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, uh, membership of a particular group, their sexual orientation, or uh, political opinion. Um, so they migrate, and we know that in many cultures, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals would be discriminated against. Um, it's also important, as I mentioned earlier, that this loss of the familiar, loss of attitudes, loss of values, loss of relationships can cause uh, cultural bereavement. And cultural bereavement will affect cultural identity in the new society. And it's been described as something called a stripe de zebra which is that there are two parallel identities, one original and one new one. And again, I can sort of identify with this because when I go to India, um, it takes me 10 days to get into what I call my Indian mode of thinking. Until then, I have very kind of British attitudes, British uh, perceptions, and I get irritated by little things. But after 10 days, something happens to my brain, and I switch into my old identity within which um, I was brought up. So the recommendations for policymakers, service providers, and clinicians are that we need very clear policies for migration, for human rights, and we need adequate resources for services, particularly when people don't speak the language, trying to understand their distress in their primary language becomes incredibly important. And therefore, we also need adequate resources for training. And there needs to be joint of working. Health should not be seen in isolation. Health, justice, education all come together. And again, as uh, Professor Mai earlier talked about, uh, we need to be looking at public education. For us as clinicians, we need to provide services which are easy to navigate. Most patients find it very difficult to understand why they are being referred to someone else, uh, even from clinical services to social services to housing uh, to employment. We need to be culturally sensitive, which is about good clinical practice. Services need to be both geographically and emotionally uh, accessible. There needs to be some training in cultural competence. Whether we have cultural brokers or cultural liaison officers, um, again, depends upon local resources. Um, any research must have both qualitative and quantitative um, components. Should we have specific services for migrants alone? I think that's a debate the profession needs to have. There are advantages and there are disadvantages. But what we do need is a very clear inclusion in the curriculum and as part of the training. To, to draw the relationship between migration and schizophrenia, migration and um, mental health to a close, um, there are very clear links with socioeconomic disadvantage. We know that mental health is affected by uh, social determinants, 
racial discrimination plays a role, whether it is direct um, racism or indirect in terms of controlling resources. I, I think the evidence that there are underlying biological factors is not as strong as I would like it to be. Is it about pre-morbid personality? Again, um, we don't know, but here is a challenge for Italy. If, as you are accepting more migrants, here is an opportunity, research-wise, to look at long-term outcomes, creating a case register, creating uh, services where you can follow up individuals for a long time to see um, how things change, so you get much more prospective data rather than uh, simply associations. And obviously, we need to do more uh, work on achievement and expectation assessment and expectations and also a relationship between cultures where migrants come from and cultures they migrate to, so it's socio-centric versus egocentric. And we need to look at um, social networks and social support systems. Uh, once again, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. Uh, for your very kind and generous hospitality and thank you for listening.